Whenever you get the opportunity to hang around people like this, your life is enriched. And your, your leadership team here, I'm including that group in this too. Uh, you can go a lot of places. You heard that here a couple of times this morning. And you can go places all over the world, all over this country, where you don't really feel that a church is healthy. And here you do. And when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to minister here, um, what I'm going to talk about this morning, I probably wouldn't say everywhere, but because you're healthy, I feel I can say. And uh, so that, that's exciting for me. <laughs> I had a message, I sent it to Colby, and then I sent another email and said, cancel that whole thing. <laughs> All that nice keynote and everything, just scrap it because I think I have to do something else. When I, was, when I was hitting the return button, you know, on to send the email, it was just like, I don't think that's right, but I'm going to send it because, but anyhow, so we're going to do something a little different. But really glad to spend time with good, healthy people. You know, lots of times when we're somewhere, and you could even be on an airplane, you're, you're putting out to somebody that needs something. And you get around a group of people that aren't in need, it's really awesome. You know, where you can just receive from each other, hear what's going on. And uh, your church has certainly grown in a lot of different ways, and I'll, I want to say something about that. So, uh, I think that inside every Christian, there is a knowing that God wants to do something great. He wants to use you. Now, some people will doubt that more than they will believe that which is unfortunate because that's part of even in the pastoral gift is that you're trying to mine all of that up and out of people because what's in you is so precious and so valuable that the church can't function like it should without what you have. And yet the devil tries to a lot of people all the time that you don't really have anything that's really worthwhile. You screwed up your life so much. You've made so many bad decisions. Da, 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 da. That doesn't change what's inside of you. So if we have to clean some things up, we clean it up so that we can start to blossom where we are. So sometimes, you know, I don't know if people really realize the awesome plan that God has for your life individually and then corporately as a church. That I can guarantee you this, it's beyond what you can see today. So what I want to talk about today is uh, how can we ensure that we get to that place that is beyond what we can see today. How do, you, how, how do you do that as an individual, and how do we do that as a church? And it's not really a big secret, but... So, open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. And I'll get there in just a moment. When you think about God's plan for man, it took a lot of moving pieces to get from Adam to Jesus, didn't it? I mean, we've got a pretty big, thick part of the Bible. That's the part of the Bible that when I got saved, um, my friends told me, they gave me a Bible and they said, open it up to the Gospel of John and said, start reading here. And I said, why would I start reading two-thirds of the way through the book? And they said, well, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament, and you should read the New Testament first. So I said, well, why didn't they put that in the front part of the book then? <laughs> Nothing made any sense about that to me. So it took a while for me to get back to the Old Testament and start reading some of that. And then when I did, you know, some of the stories you go, okay, those are good. Other parts of it, you're just like, okay, I know God is supernatural and, and Scripture is supposed to be inspired. But the only thing that I can find about some of these Scriptures, they are supernaturally boring. <laughs> or was I the only one who felt that way? You're going, why would he put all this in here? Now, I think this particular one we can find a lot of good things about. But So there was a lot happened between Adam and Jesus, and there were a lot of names mentioned in Scripture. God knows your name too, by the way. And you are a part of something he's been moving and getting into place for a very long time. Way before you were ever born, he saw you. He, he ordained that you would be born and that you would eventually be here. 
How awesome is it that he can move you around like that? And, and people are not easy to get moved around. I mean, you think about God's job and you go, how does he ever make this work? Because if you were half as stubborn and blind as I was, I don't know how he got you anywhere. So we'll figure that out. But anyhow, then from Jesus to now, God has been working through his body. You know, this great plan of redemption that, that took place, now he's wanting to get out to everyone. Right? We know that. But everyone. So if that's true, which it is, and you're a part of that plan, which you are, and he brought you all together in a church for that purpose, how much more awesome are some things needing to be in the future than you even have today? How much bigger? And we humans sometimes get to our capacity before God is done with us. So we want to enlarge that capacity again. We want to renew some of that in us so our capacity is big enough to get done in and through us what God needs done. Why? Because people's lives are at stake. Eternity is at stake. We sing, you know, I didn't know one of those songs. That second one we sang today, that was an awesome song. I mean, you know, Pastor Nate said he was a little weepy. Me too. I was just glad we had another song before I had to come up. Thank you. I mean, those are some good words in that song, aren't they? Wow. And you think about this awesome salvation that God provided for man, and how great of a love is it that he would do all of this to get to people? <laughs> you almost can't comprehend it with human understanding, can you? What he did for us. And so it's big. God is always working on people to get them into a place where he can do something bigger than they ever imagined. And some of it has to be done together, not just individually. All right. So, Joshua chapter 1. Well, let me just say this more specifically here too again. I believe that God has something of greater significance for beyond than you have experienced or seen yet. And whenever you hear something like that, whenever you know something like that, God is going to require something of you for that to happen. And that's why I say I feel I can say this today because you're healthy. So, you know, what, is it, what exactly does that mean? I don't know exactly what that means. That's something you guys will have to figure out. But we can talk about how we can get there. So, in Joshua chapter 1, uh, you remember the Israelites are finally getting to a place where they can cross the Jordan. And, and what is on the other side? Their promised land. This is something that, that the Lord had spoke to Moses about given them a vision about, you know, this is the land that I've given to you. It flows with milk and honey. I mean, it's good. And how would that sound if you had been a people in bondage for hundreds of years? Your land, a place that has abundance, not scarcity. I mean, I, do you think they could even really picture what that meant? I don't know. Maybe they couldn't. But as we know, it took them 40 years to do an 11-day walk. I wonder sometimes how quick I should have gotten somewhere, and about how long did it really take me. Ugh, I don't even like to think about that. So in chapter 1, Moses had died. He'd been there a long time leader, and now God is speaking to Joshua, who is now going to lead the Israelites. I think he knew that day was coming, but still, this is a big job. And so what are the first things that God says to him in that chapter? Be strong and courageous. <laughs> That's not a good word from the Lord, by the way, because when he tells you that, you're in for something. <laughs> He's just giving you this anchor word that you're going to need over and over and over again. And by the way, I'm going to give you that same word. You're going to have to be strong and courageous for what God has for you, if you really want to do it. If you really want to get to that place where God wants you to be. Whatever that means. 
So he went on and he said, you know, make sure you read this book of instructions. Meditate in it day and night. You think, I think you guys are doing that. You have the word before you. You're taught the word. You sing the word. This is exactly what God wants for us. And he said, when you meditate in him, then you'll have success. Not a new word there. We know that. So this wasn't, this, this leadership that he gave Joshua now wasn't simply just to lead the Israelites, but to lead them to a place they'd never been before. That's a little different sometimes. He wasn't saying, just keep doing the same thing and wander around the desert. They knew how to do that. He didn't need much practice for that one. Joshua was one of those guys that had been trying to get out of there for a long time. But some things had to change in, in all of their people for that to happen. There were some steps coming that would take them into the promised land. And Joshua was the one that's supposed to lead. I, you know, I, I know some of the church history of beyond. I don't know all of it. Here's what I do know. That um, the church existed with a different name. And then, for some reason, God sent Pastor Kevin and Susan here. And some of you might have wished that he hadn't. But he did. Not everybody loves all of us, do they? I know it's hard to imagine not loving you, Susan, but it probably has happened. <laughs> but he sent them here. And I mean, it was, it's kind of an odd place from where they were to come here. And it's one of the things that inside them, they knew that they knew it was God. And they had to know that for all that was going to happen. But he didn't send them here to replicate what had been going on in the history of this church. He sent them here to take the church to another place that they hadn't been before. And that's rough sometimes. And not everybody says, hey, we're with you. We're behind you. Some people get so far behind you, you can't see them anymore. (laughs) And sometimes that's good. So maybe not everybody was thrilled about this new direction. But still, it was necessary, and they had to be strong and courageous if they were going to take the steps to take the church to go to a place where it had never been before. We get comfortable, don't we? Even sometimes when things aren't right, we get comfortable. There's churches all over the planet. You know, sometimes you go into a church and visit, and I think, why in the world would anybody waste their time coming here? And that's a horrible thing to say about a church, the place that's supposed to be changing lives. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't come here. I'd come here, (laughs) just to be clear. (laughs) So, you know, God sends leaders, like, he, like even when it changed out with Moses and Joshua, he tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. He's telling leaders all over the place that need to change things to be strong and courageous. And then he wants us to go somewhere together. Not splintered, not half of us, but he wants us to go together. Here's the real challenge sometimes. Why did it take 40 years to cross the desert? Because they had to get rid of some unbelief. There were some people that were going to die off. Did they have to? I didn't, if they didn't have unbelief, I don't think they would have had to. But they couldn't go where they needed to go with all of that unbelief. And how did that unbelief manifest itself in the Israelites? Murmuring and complaining. Um, how does that manifest itself in our lives? Well, that's right. Same way, doesn't it? So this is a big challenge for any leader. Oftentimes, the assignments that God gives us can be daunting. And that's why we have to be strong and courageous. And I'm not just talking about the leader here now. If you're going to go with a leader who is strong and courageous, who's, got, who's going to take you somewhere you've never been before, you're going to have to walk by faith too. You're going to have to have that same spirit to move forward as the leader does. Otherwise, you're, it feels like you're dragging people. God doesn't want anybody to be dragged. They want everybody, like, we're with you. 
I mean, I, I'm not going to read through all the verses that in between, you know, Joshua 1.1 1, 1, and then you get to the third chapter because basically they said, yeah, if, if the people don't come along, if there's, we find anybody against it, we'll just kill them. It's like, wow. They're, they were serious, weren't they? So these guys were with them. So let's jump over to Joshua chapter 3. And just verses 1 through 5 as a reference. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. They're getting close. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. And yet there shall be a space between you of about 2,000 cubits by measure, uh, come not near unto it, let you may know the way by which you should go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. We're reading out of old King James today. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Well, we love that part about do wonders among you, but that first part of the verse there, Sanctify yourself. Oh, gosh, did he have to bring that up? Consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. What does it mean to consecrate yourself? I actually looked up a definition on this one, so I'll read it. To consecrate yourself essentially means to wholly dedicate yourself to something of greatest importance. When spoken plainly, however, consecration refers to the act of setting yourself aside and dedicating yourself to a deity and that deity almost always refers to the God of Christianity. Which I think that's kind of interesting that even when you, when you Google the word consecrate, this is the definition it gives you. And it seems that a lot of other religions don't consecrate themselves like Christianity does. Huh. So we could say it this way. Here's a word that I think you guys have used around here a lot. Yes. It's saying yes to God. It's saying yes to God, an unconditional yes to God. And when you do that, when you give an unconditional yes to God, you will absolutely take, it'll take you out of your comfort zone. You have a comfort zone? I, I, I could tell you the rest of the time here today, all the times God has taken me out of my comfort zone. I'm standing in one right now. Public speaking was my greatest fear. I tried for years to negotiate with God so I wouldn't have to do this. Let me stay in business. You know, I'm just, it's, he's not listening to that. <laughs> he is not going to change his mind. So it's just like blah, 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 blah. You are. And then when you finally say, okay, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. He goes, now, as I was saying. And 10 years might have just gone by. But he can't do anything with us if we aren't saying yes. So it's going to take you out of your comfort zone. It's going to stretch you further than you want. It's going to stretch you further than you want. It's going to kill many of your own dreams. Now, you're not going to be left short on anything. He'll replace those dreams with better ones. But if you got some that are just yours, those are probably going to get killed. How many of you wish you just stayed home and not come to Beyond this morning? <laughs> That's my message. God is a dream killer. <laughs> he is. Now, he might move you geographically sometimes. Now, I don't think he'll do that that's not the context this morning. But he did move some people geographically. He did move some people geographically. And I don't know where all the rest of you came from. But maybe he moved you here too. So that can happen. It absolutely will, will require that we trust God. 
saying yes to God will prove to be the best thing you have ever done. When Michelle and I got married, we met at Rama. We met, we went to school in the fall of 1979, and it was a one-year school at that time, so that's what we did. I probably should have stayed around for quite a few more years, but I didn't. <laughs> Kevin and Susan were in the same class. We didn't know them then. But uh, I went to Rama because I had a leading. I didn't know why. I didn't go there because I felt I was called to ministry. I just knew I should go there. Somebody came back from Rhema and says to me one day, John, you should go to Rhema. Well, they were weird. <laughs> and on the inside, I'm thinking, there's no way in, that I'm going to Rhema if I turn out like you. <laughs> I wasn't quite as sanctified yet. That's what I was thinking. But those words stuck with me. And when words like that stick with you, you know that there's something you should do with them. And so I finally applied, and I never, I was working with my dad in his real estate company. I didn't say anything to him because, number one, he wasn't a Christian, and number two, I didn't think they would accept me. I wouldn't have accepted me the way I filled out that application. I didn't know the answer to anything. Well, I did get accepted, so all of a sudden I said, hey, Dad, and told him, and he was disappointed. And I said to my dad at the time, I said, Dad, I believe that someday you'll understand the wisdom of what I'm doing. I was hoping I would. <laughs> <laughs> and it took about nine years before he came back to me and said, I understand why you went. When I went off to Rama, he got saved. That was good. Anyhow. Um, so there was, there was a lot of times, you know, in the early part of our marriage especially that then God was starting to deal with my heart. She was always willing to do whatever God wanted. She was not the problem. But I didn't want to do what he wanted to do. I didn't want to speak. I didn't want to be a minister. I mean, honestly, I thought so many of the ministers I knew were a little retarded. I didn't really want to be in that group. I loved Brother Hagen. I loved how he changed my life. But I don't know if I wanted to be him either. So I was dragging my feet and working and we're doing fine that way. But on the inside, God just won't leave me alone. And so finally one day I said, okay, God, really, whatever you want me to do. I'll do it, even if it includes speaking. Why well, wouldn't? It was the one prayer in my life I was hoping he didn't hear. <laughs> well, he heard it. And it wasn't long after that, and we went to pastor in Indiana. Uh, so that took a little while. But, you know, my, <clears throat> my unbelief, my lack of consecration was keeping me out of the things that God had for us, and, and then ultimately for other people, too. So my stubbornness, my unwillingness would possibly hurt other people. Well, I don't want to be responsible for that one, do you? So unbelief, we want to get rid of that. If it stopped them from crossing the Jordan into the promised land, into the place they'd never been before, what will it stop us from seeing? Will we ever get to the place we should get to if we're still resisting somehow? I learned. I'm happy to do the will of God. I will go anywhere and do anything he wants today. Because you're never, you'll never find a more peaceful, happy place than the will of God. If he'd have told me to stay in business, that's where I would have been the happiest. I didn't do this because I wanted to. We did it because he wanted to. It was his will. It wasn't something that we could choose it was something that he assigned. You have to find out what your assignment is. And for most of you, that will involve being right in here giving your supply. And that makes this body strong. We're not looking for everybody to go out and have their own ministry. Some will, few will, 
Very few will. The most stay right here and make a local church strong. And there's plenty of place to give your supply in a place like this. If you think there isn't, then just keep developing, growing, and you'll, you, you'll find a place. So in the early 1980s, I don't remember the exact year and probably doesn't matter, but we, were, I, we I were at a seminar, and uh, all I remember is me sitting there. I don't remember who was sitting next to me. But Brother Hagen was speaking, and he's starting to tell a story that I'd heard before, and on the inside, I was going, oh, God, that same old story again. And right then, he stops and says, now, some of you are wondering why I tell these stories over. <laughs> I mean, I'm turning red. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, he's going to call me out by name now. This is going to be embarrassing. And he said, when you get what I'm trying to say through these, I'll move on. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's my fault. <laughs> he's wanting to share some things, but he can't because I'm sitting here whining about the story he's telling. And right there I said, Lord, I repent. I will never say those words again. I'll never think those words again. When he tells those stories, I'm going to listen like it's the first time I heard, and I'm going to get something out of it. And we did. We did. I've never thought that again. But, but my unbelief in that form kept God from maybe saying something he wanted to say. I don't know how many other people were in there thinking that that night, but I knew I was. And when he started talking about it, I mean, I'm serious, I turned red. I was like, hey. So we don't want to do that. So consecration can be an early and a continual step of faith to keep us in the position to do what we have never done before. I'll say that again. I have to read it because I just wrote it down. It says, so consecration can, keep, can be an early and continual step of faith to keep us in the position to do what we have never done before. Joshua 3, 5 again says this, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourself or consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. If he did it for them, he'll do the same for us. What area of life do we need to consecrate? You, I think you are all good Christians. But we're still people and sometimes we have areas of our life that we need to consecrate. Now, I'm not going to make a big deal where we say come to the altar, cry, and do all that. That's not my point here today. This has to be something that becomes a lifestyle. Where when we recognize we are in unbelief or we're doing whatever, that we're not following him the way we should, we're resisting that we consecrate. Some years back... I was in Wisconsin ministering at some friend's church. And during the praise and worship, I hear this on the inside. Speak today about the prayer that helped you the most. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> uh, don't do this to me. Because <laughs> I, I, then on the inside I said, uh, what prayer would that be? I didn't know what he was talking about. If you can say, talk about the prayer that helped you the most, why not just tell me what that is? Because there's like two songs left before I have to go up. So I'm like, oh, okay, Lord, help me, help me, help me. So I, I knew then. I, I knew which one it was. You know, and for me, because of the type of person I was, you know which prayer has helped me the most and, and moved me forward? The prayer of consecration. So when I got up that, that, that morning, then we turned and we read about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. How many of you have ever been to the Garden of Gethsemane? I hope you get to go there someday. I don't know if everybody, you know, I'm not one of these person, people like when you fly in somewhere, they say, hey, so did you feel the spiritual atmosphere? Normally, no, I don't. But it's for some reason, when I go to the Garden of Gethsemane, I've probably been there three or four times now. There is just something about that place. 
you look across the valley back over to the Temple Mount, but there's just there's a patch of trees there, probably some of them which Jesus was in, when he gave that final consecration, not my will, but your will, before he was going to pay that ultimate price where he could take humanity to a place they'd never been before. He had to go there first. He had to go to a place he'd never been so he could take other people to a place where they'd never been. We couldn't be here today if Jesus hadn't consecrated himself in the garden. And I don't know as if he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew he was going to be offered up. But I don't know if he knew about all the beating he was going to take. But he knew he was going to give his life. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. <laughs> you got to have something in front of you to be able to do what God wants you to do. It has to be more about others than it is about you. And you're going to have to be strong and courageous. In your individual life, there are some places God wants you to go you haven't been yet. There are some things he wants you to do you haven't done yet. And then together, this church, he has something for this church that is much more significant than you've seen yet. I don't think most churches have gone there and affected their communities the way God wants them to. When God plants a church, that's like him putting his foot down and saying, I want to do business from this place. I want light to go out from here. I want love to go out from here. I want this to be a place where when people come in, they do feel at home, they feel loved, they get their life transformed in a significant way. I would never be happy. We were never happy pastoring if people just came in and left the same, the way they came in. Go, go to the grocery store then. We're, we have to be a place where we transform lives. So that has to be before us. That that's, you guys expect that. You, what's the sign over your door say? Yeah. Your expectation is invitation for God to move. That's awesome. And it is. Don't ever get used to reading that sign. Tap it with your hand every time. Say it out loud and say, I believe it. And that's the way I'm entering into this room every single time. Because when you do, oh, it creates a place for God to do something. So don't ever let that become commonplace. So we need to stay consecrated. You ever had your own dreams and ideas about what you wanted to do? Well, probably. I did. Before I got saved, I was in, when I was in high school, because I got saved a week after high school. When I was in high school, I, I said, as soon as I graduate, I'm going to move to Alaska. I was going to work in the fishing industry for a couple of years, make some money, and then the government would give you about 160 acres up there as long as you'd build something on it, and you could live happily ever after away from humans. <laughs> to me, that was the perfect dream. You get to hunt, you get to fish, you get to build, and you know people problems. Well, that's childish thinking. So I got saved and God ruined that dream. And he never, I never went to Alaska until 2011. Probably if I had gone much earlier, I might have stayed still. Well, and then, you know, we were living in Colorado and just outside the mountains, you know, perfect postcard view. And I, I fell in love with the mountains. Grew up until I was 15 in Wisconsin and I thought that was beautiful and loved four feet of snow every year as a kid. Don't love it now. You're welcome. You can have that. But I fell in love with the mountains for some reason. I feel at home in the mountains still today. If there's a place that I, I enjoy the most, it's the mountains. But you know what? God just won't let me live there. So he moves us to Germany in 1993. We spent 23 years there in an area, a population zone of over 20 million people. 
traffic, humans. <laughs> For the joy that was set before us, changing lives, taking the, the message of faith and, the, and the, this awesome salvation that we've been given to that part of the world. But it took consecration. And not just once. Like I say, it keeps you in the place too. So, then we've, after Germany, then we moved to England. I mean, that was actually easier. <laughs> it's, it's easier to live in England than it is in Germany for a number of reasons. And, uh, you know, we were around people again that we could be friends with. Kevin and Susan were there. And we didn't really have that in Germany all those years, not quite the same. We had a good team, good leadership team, but really not peers like that where you could have that kind of thing. So that was, that was awesome. Anyhow, so consecration is something that, you know, we have to, it has to be kind of out in the forefront continually because otherwise life starts saying, I want to do this or I don't want to do this, or I'd really like this, and I'm going to head toward this. And sometimes it's not what God wants. You know, I, I often speak about, at least for a while when I go to a church, why are you here on the earth and why are you breathing? I mean, I wanted to find that out. I didn't want to just go through life and be like everybody else. I wanted to find out, you know, if God really made me, what did he make me for? Why am I here? If I'm going to take up air, it should be used right. That's why you find that in Matthew 16, 18. You don't need to turn there, but when Jesus is walking along with his disciples and says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, oh, some are John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. He was, that was wrong. But he didn't correct him. He said, who do you say I am? They'd spend a little bit of time with him, and Peter speaks up and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He got it right. He said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you by my Father which is in heaven. He said, And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As soon as he was revealed as the Christ, he declared what he was going to do for the next 2,000 years. I will build my church. He didn't explain it at that point in time. He just said, I will build my church. And I don't even think they knew what that meant. I will build my church. And you know what? He's never changed his mind. For the, from that time to now, that is the number one thing that Jesus is thinking about, building his church. When we build people, we build the church. When we get people saved, we grow the church. But that's what he's doing. Now you can say, well, but, you know, that'd be great if I could work full time. No, that doesn't always work that way either. He needs you out in the marketplace too because you build the church out there. I'm not talking about working in a church. We're talking about building the church. Big difference. <laughs> doesn't matter what we do or where we do it, does it? As long as we're doing it. And he'll move you around. If you just stay consecrated and you're growing, I guarantee you he'll get you to the place where you need to be. You don't have to strive for that. But you must keep growing. Well, I need to wrap this up. You know what? God knows the end from the beginning, but he's not going to tell you every step from here till the end. We have to take the next step, whatever that might be. There's never a time that we don't get to walk by faith. We must. So whoever you are, whatever God has put in you, number one, if you're not sure what that gift is that he's placed in you, and how you should fulfill your assignment here on the earth, you have to start working on that and figure some of that out. If you're not sure, you plug into a local church and you do whatever they need and you grow. And then whatever that special gift is, that grace that you've been given, it will start to blossom. You'll start to recognize it, that you have a leaning some, one way or another. But in the house sometimes, we just do whatever's needed. I've said this many times, you know, that when our kids were younger and we were still living in Germany, our trash had to be out early in the morning. And if I hollered up the stairs and said, 
uh, kids, time to collect the trash, bring it down. If I heard all the kids say, Dad, we don't really feel very anointed when we do the trash. Or, we'll pray about it. Or, we don't feel led. Well, and I'd be right up there going, well, I'll be right up to help you feel led. <laughs> the anointing is coming. <laughs> now, sometimes we just got to do stuff. You know, it's like, the, the, whose job is to take out the trash? Who's ever there when it gets full? It's like, well, it's not my job. Well, stop that. Right? Let's just do it. Let's just join together and do what we need to do. Then beyond that, let's consecrate ourselves. So as a church, as beyond here, I, I truly believe that God has something so significant for this church that if you will take all the right steps, like consecrate, and like I say, that's, that's something that might just is an ongoing thing. God is, you guys are a church that prays. So that's, that's a normal part of your prayer life, I think. And keep praying. Because if you'll keep praying, you'll keep consecrating and dedicating yourself and let God work some things out of you that maybe shouldn't be there. And you'll just keep walking. And one day you'll put your foot out there like he did with the Israelites. You know, the ones who were carrying the ark, they had to put their foot into the water a little bit. And then, it, then he did the wonders. They didn't wait there until it was all back and dried up. They just kept walking. And sometimes it didn't look like the right time. It didn't look like the right place. It didn't look like anything was going to happen. But it was the right step. That's the thing with God. It, not everything he asks us to do makes sense. And that's hard on us, isn't it? But it's fun too. Amen. Let's stand up this morning. Well, I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm just going to turn it back over to Pastor Nate. Father, I thank you so much for this church. For each person here, I thank you for how you've led people here with Pastors Kevin and Susan, and then you led them off to another place, and Pastors Nate and Evan and all of their team here, Father. I pray for them, that they, as leaders, for one, be strong and courageous, because you want to take this church to a place that it's never been before. Thank you, Father, for your word that this is a church that does read, study, meditate, say, and sing your word. We know that because of that, they will follow in the path of success. And when we say success here, we mean your plan, your purpose is being fulfilled. Father, we love you. I thank you for the hearts of these people. I thank you, Father, for blessing them, for following you, above and beyond all they could ask or think. Do significant things in their midst this year, significant things individually. Father, this church showed how they handle a tragedy. They came together. They stood together. They believed you when things didn't look like that's the way they would go. They've proved themselves to you in that. So, Father, we thank you for bigger things for this church because it will touch this community in this area. Thank you, Lord, for your plans for continue revealing them clarity to the, to the leaders, to, especially to Pastor Nate and Evan, for all that you have. We love you, Father, and we want to just say that we're so thankful to be a part of the body of Christ, to be a part of this church, and to be part of what you are doing on the earth today, building the church. We love you, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Nate.
kind of stay down here to close. Um, we're going to dismiss. Uh, and, you know, I, I had this direction in my heart this morning, <clears throat> actually last week when it comes to the close of service. You know, one of the things that the Lord uh, has directed us to do is uh, he said that his house should be called a house of prayer. And, you know, we've been talking over the last year just about uh, the altar and and seeing God move and making a provision available for God to, to, to heal, to do signs and wonders. He hasn't changed uh, to testimonies to go forth. Um, and so we, you know, at the end of service, you know, a lot of times I'll be up on the stage and I'll finish teaching and, and I'll say, hey, you know, maybe we give an invitation to, you know, Jesus. Maybe if you haven't given your heart to Christ and I'd say, hey, or if you need to rededicate your life, you just want to come down, take that step and we would invite you forward. Or if there's, if you need healing in your bodies, this is another thing I'd say. If you need, or if you need healing in your bodies, we'd love to agree with you and see God move on your behalf. And um, the Lord kind of gra- grabbed me this last week, and He said, "Is everyone in your church healed?" Because, and I was like, "Well, well, I mean, uh, well, I guess so." Because we a lot of times don't have anybody come that needs any healing in their body. Because the Bible tells us that this is you know one of the ways you do prayer of agreement, laying on hands, seeing God move. And I was like, okay, well, I guess we just have a bunch of healed people. Let me tell you, if, if you, if you walk out of the church sick, that's your fault. That's your fault. And it doesn't bring God glory, and it doesn't bring him honor. And so I actually was corrected by, by just leaving an open end to even like an invitation. God in, invites, but sometimes it's kind of like this where he talks about, Hey, go to the highways and byways. Go, go, go invite those people to come because I got a plate for them. I already set the table for them. And that's what he was showing me. He said, I've, I've set the table and I've made provision available. And when that person came back, the, the, he, the, the herald came back and said, Lord, they're busy. They're looking at lands and houses. They're, they're busy. They got to get to El Torrio. They're busy, blah, 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 blah. He said, Go find somebody that needs to hear or that needs what I've got. And I just hope, I hope we're not a people that leaves the church saying, what God's got, I don't really need. Because if, if, if that's the case, I'm not carrying it out there either. And this morning I sat in huddle, time when we come together and and I was listening to uh, actually Kyle. Um, you know, you can you can down on people when they're speaking, and and I was. You're like, that's a, one of your leaders. You're down on. You're telling everybody. You know, I was, because he was using this example of saying yes to God and mud in the eyes, and and I was thinking, this is what thought came to my, my mind. Okay, don't tell him that. Don't tell him to go spit in mud. Like, don't tell him that. Like, this is the thought that came to my mind. And, and the Lord's like, really? Like, just grabbed me in, in my heart where my head was like, you know. And I'm not telling you to go spit in mud. But here's what I'm telling you. And I'm not down. And the Lord corrected me, so I was wrong there. Thank God for his correction. But what he was saying, and as I, and I, as I listened to what he was saying, and as the Lord said, hey, and I listened in, he was telling the people that God is still healing bodies. That God, what God has set on the table is still for today. That he is so good. Listen, the, the good news is what we're to be carrying. But if we come into a church and we leave without receiving the good things that he has for us, then what in the world are we going to carry? And I am so thankful for somebody that's going to say, let's believe God. Because, you know, sometimes you kind of just stop, believe, like you get a little burry, right? And it's that iron that sharpens iron that, that, that gets you back to that cutting edge to where you need to be. Because, again, just like John was saying, it's really not. Your consecration isn't even so much about you as it is about what God is desiring to do through you. Like, like the people that could be missing out because of what you don't say yes to. So it does matter. And I love that. And I just want to say thank you for ministering today and ministering that word. Um, 
But anyway, so this is the corrective word, and thank God that I'm willing to do that. So, you know, sometimes you don't want to do it, but praise the Lord. And so, um, but it, today, if you if you if you need healing in your body, uh, if you need to give your heart to Jesus, if you need agreement for anything, the Bible says if two agree touching touching anything, if you need a job, if you need fin- financial increase, if you need wisdom concerning whatever it might be, then let's see God. Uh, honor his word because he's still watching over his word to perform it today he is today watching over it just as the rain comes down from heaven and it doesn't evaporate before it does what it was set forth to do which is water the earth and cause things to bloom and that's how God's word goes forth he says it'll go forth and it will accomplish what it was set forth to do guys let's put God in remembrance of his word let's put God in check every time we're here because that's called faith stepping out of what God has said and you'll see we'll see him move and we'll have something to carry which is the good news because it's time that every one of us have a testimony that's fresh a fresh testimony amen Amen. So if you need healing in your bodies uh, or anything, or just need agreement in prayer, we'd love to agree with you up after uh, church here. Other than that, go grab your kids. Have a great Sunday afternoon, and we'll see you Wednesday night. God bless.